Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, I think that we are in a, in a very exciting time because uh, we have uh, excellent tools to dissect uh, many aspects about the biology of the individuals. And, uh, and this is uh, both at the clinical level, but also at the molecular level. And uh, while you know, in some areas of medicine we are able to uh, substitute the classical forendoscope that we are using to, uh, to explore the cardiofunctional um, you know, characteristics of the individual by this kind of echography that we can carry out carry on and, and we can bring it to the emergency room or we can you know, use it you know, uh, at the home of the, of the patient and so on. And we can also monitor you know, many aspects about the physiology of the, of the individual uh, at the distance. I think that one of the, 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 the things and one of the main goals that we have for the future is to be able to monitor many aspects of the biology at the distance also of the individual. And this is something that we can foresee that is going to happen in the next 10 years, that's uh, quite sure. Uh, if we try to put uh, together what it will be, you know, the, the, the geographic information of a human being, so we can have many different layers of um, factors that are uh, having an important role in the biology of everyone. We have the exposition to many factors that are you know, influencing our, our health and our uh, physiology. Uh, there are marks that, you know, this exposition are living in our, in our genome, which are these epigen epigenetic marks. We have also uh, the interplay with our microbes that colonize our body and that are, you know, are, they have, you know, an important role that is still quite not well or quite an explore. And then we have the metabolome, we have the proteome, and we have the transcriptome, and we have you know, one time point, which is this genome that we can uh, explore and that we are now analyzing in this. And this is the topic of what we are doing in this course. Uh, but we have many other layers, you know, imaging, biosensors, the social graph of a given individual, what we are doing, you know, along the day and along the week or the month or the years and so on. Uh, since 2001 to 2015, I think that we have learned uh, a big deal about the variability of the human genome and about the different phenotypic consequences at the level of uh, the variants that we have in our genome that uh, have important uh, consequences from the point of view of the inheritance and so on, but also about uh, uh, at the phen phenotypic level. Uh, and in fact, uh, it has been not only the knowledge of the sequence of the human genome, but also the technologies that we are using uh, in the recent years that we have been able to dissect the majority of the genes that are responsible for uh, most of the uh, Mendelian disorders. And I would say that now more than 4,000 genes that are responsible for um, a similar number of Mendelian disorders are known. And this is in part thanks to next generation sequencing. And you can see here how uh, or the number of uh, genes involved in, 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 in genetic disorders that are being detected. And this is as a result of next generation sequencing being applied you know, in a systematic way in Mendelian disorders. Uh, in the field of complex disorders, the situation uh, it has been also of a very good progress. But this has not been achieved through uh, sequencing. This has been achieved through genotyping. Uh, so the very good information about the variability of the human genome and the exploration of all the different types and numbers of uh, variants that we have, have um, has been used in a systematic way in complex disorders uh, through um, genome-wide genome association scans, GWAS. And what you have here is a representation of the different chromosomes with different groups of phenotypes for which significant association has been detected through uh, genotyping. So in this case, what it has been used is a large number of uh, SNPs, uh, so single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, in general about one million of them in cases and controls. And what you see here are more than mm, 17 or 17 trait categories of cardiovascular, 
mental disorders, infection, uh, inflammation, autoimmunity, and so on, and cancer. And uh, the figures are that there are more than 15,000 SNPs that are shown to, associate, to be associated to phenotypes. There are more than 2,000 uh, papers published in the last uh, seven or eight years. And in all cases, the information that has been achieved through uh, genotyping has um, been important from the point of view of understanding much better the biology of the different disorders. But the other side of the coin is that um, the effects that has been seen are relatively small, and it means that they cannot be translated into clinical applications at least in the majority of uh, cases and for the majority of the disorders. And if we increase the, samples, the sample size, uh, we detect many more effects, uh, which are also small. And as I say, the, 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 um, there is little value from the prevention point of view, from the diagnostics point of view. And uh, in fact, in general, uh, for the different phenotypes and so on, the variants represent or explain less than 10% of the heritability of those disorders that they have been shown to have an important heritable component. Uh, so there are many potential explanations about the missing heritability and uh, about, despite you know, all this uh, large amount of data that has been generated with all so many papers and, and interesting findings, but uh, the explanations could be that we are missing this uh, genetic component because we have been targeting common variants and in fact we are all carrying hundreds and thousands of rare variants in our genome and that perhaps the rare variants uh, not not, uh, not at the individual level, but you know, uh, in conjunction, in a sort of convergent way, are responsible for some of the phenotypes. Uh, and also, uh, the level of the different variants, especially the rare one, ones, uh, they have different uh, degrees of penetrance. And we can see this for some of the heritable uh, cancers that have been detected, where we have you know, some highly damaging mutations that are responsible for breast cancer, colon cancer, and some other uh, Mendelian phenotypes. But there are other variants that may have you know, uh, uh, and a smaller effect. And then what it could be is that there will be you know, several variants working together uh, for a given phenotype. And if we all carry thousands and thousands of different variants, it will be very difficult to detect those ones through association studies. Other areas that have not been explored through all these genotyping uh, essays is that is our epigenetic changes, uh, editing of, um, of uh, proteins, and, and, and also uh, that we are not exploring at all the, the RNA. Coding, non-coding variants may have an important role, and most of the studies that have been performed so far, and all these duos, they do not explore the function of, uh, of the genome. And there are some other issues that now are emerging to be important for some of the different uh, complex disorders. One is structural variance, so the fact that our genome is not exactly the same from one individual to the other, and that we carry duplications, deletions, inversions, transpositions of genetic <coughs> material, and some of those ones uh, are being um, 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 driven by retrotransposon elements, which is, are very ab abundant in our genome. About 40% of our genome is, is, is made of this type of, uh, of structures, and in some cases they are mobile, they are plastic, and they may have functional consequences. And then there is another issue uh, that is somatic mosaicism. So mutations that may not be present in all cells of the individuals, but they may be present in a subset of them, and that may, this is not being uh, detected when we are analyzing just the blood of a given subject. So now technology is there, um, and then if we combine very good phenotypic characterization of the individuals, we can perform different types of analysis at the level of RNA, at the level of DNA, and uh, this hopefully uh, apply to um, very good cores and very good experimental conditions is going to give us you know, uh, much better information than what we have been able to achieve uh, so far for complex disorders. I would say that for Mendelian disorders, it's clear 
DNA is it's providing a lot of uh, information. There are cases that are unsolved, and then you know likely we will need you know the conversions of different types of of, uh, of experiments. So it's sequencing, 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 and sequencing of different uh, types of um, uh, genetic material from the from the individuals, and of course exon is the topic of this uh, of this course, but. Uh, we are moving uh, very quickly towards uh, genome sequencing and there are many other types of sequencing that are providing uh, very good information about uh, many aspects of the biology of, of the cell. So I think that you have seen likely this slide or something similar to this. <clears throat> and what is important is that we have very good pipelines that are able to, uh, to go through uh, the data that is produced for a given sample uh, so that uh, we can perform all the quality controls and that we get you know, a very good uh, data set of, um, of sequence that can uh, be analyzed uh, using different pipelines and there are many uh, of those who want to identify point mutations, structural variants, uh, in deletions and insertions and while for some um, um, types of data sets this is uh, relatively easy because either you have you know parents and the affected individual so that you, you, you you're able to trace you know the heritability or you have you know uh, a tumor and a normal sample and then you can compare one one to the other but what is, is true is that those uh, um, algorithms and those uh, pipelines are not are not perfect and there are many that are, have been compared and then that if you give you know, a sample to a, a, give, a given laboratory you may get you know different results and different answers on the basis of, of the tools that have been used but what is important is that you have very robust uh, you know um, tools that are being applied in a, in a very systematic way to finally identify the potential variants that will be uh, important for a given phenotype and then that you can run those ones through uh, pathway analysis recurrence and, and, and so on so there are different experimental approaches that are being used uh, and I think that through some of the talks uh, some of those ones have been discussed uh, trios is oh, oh, sorry trios is a very good uh, approach in which you have the parents of the affected individual and so you can trace what is being inherited and what may uh, be appearing de novo and for some disorders like you know neurode neurodevelopmental disorders for intellectual disability schizophrenia and several others uh, de novo mutations are quite common and are being detected and in this sense it's important to have you know uh, the, the dna samples of the three individuals in other cases what you do is that you identify a given phenotype that you are confident that this phenotype is very homogeneous from the clinical point of view and then you uh, analyze the, the genome of these uh, three individuals and then you see uh, look for the overlap either for the same uh, mutation or the same gene and uh, hopefully um, if you have enough individuals with the same phenotype this uh, may may happen but as um, you know as uh, most of the rare disorders are not common uh, or are, are really rare and then you you have very few individuals here and there at the end what is important is to share data that is either produced in different places or share DNA from different um, laboratories in order to perform this type of, of studies and there are many initiatives in this in this direction uh, the other approach is that in the past we were using linkage analysis linkage analysis in which, in which we have multiple individuals with the same phenotype in the same pedigree and some individuals without the phenotype and what we were doing is that we were performing uh, segregation with uh, polymorphic markers and then we were um, trying to evaluate about linkage how you know a given variant in the genome was segregating and this was uh, letting us to identify a chromosome region and and finally the gene that is responsible for the phenotype although this is 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 feasible still uh, the thing is that in most of cases there are not large families and now what you could do is that you could select some individuals from a given phenotype affected and unaffected and maybe selecting three affected and three unaffected then you could identify the um, gene 
and the mutation that is responsible for this. And then the other approach is to use extreme of a given phenotype. And this applies not for Mendelian disorders, but for complex diseases in which you have, although it could be used as, as well for, for Mendelian disorders, no? but you have other approaches to, to be more efficient. So here what you do is that you have individuals with the phenotype and individuals without the phenotype that have been very well measured, or individuals with you know, uh, different weight uh, measures, or high, or others, and then you perform uh, sequencing of the individuals of the extreme, and then you compare what uh, they share and the genes that are responsible. So I'm going to give uh, some examples of applications of uh, next generation sequencing to uh, th these three phenotypes, essential tremor, intellectual disability, and CLL, as, as concept of uh, the approaches that are being used in which uh, either there is exome sequencing most, in most of the cases or it could be whole genome sequencing and then you know the use of uh, pipelines for analysis or also you could perform targeted uh, resequencing for a given phenotype or for a given uh, disorder. So uh, the first example uh, it involves this uh, essential tremor which is um, a, a disorder that is starting relatively in the middle age of the individuals in which the individuals they have you know a tremor that is not like Parkinson but is a, is a an standing tremor that is that is occurring in about 50% of patients there is a family history of the disorder so that there are several individuals that have the same phenotype and uh, and the pattern of inheritance is in general an autosomal dominant. So there have been several um, studies trying to identify the genes responsible for that. Linkage has identified several chromosome regions, but none of the genes uh, that, that are associated with the phenotype have been uh, identified so far. And then there have been some GWAS analysis and also some exome sequencing studies trying to identify the potential genes. In GWAS analysis, there was one study in the Icelandic population and in which they found that there, were, there, are, there is a variant, in the, in, um, a variant in, the, in the sequence of the Lingo 1 gene, and this is a leucine repeat uh, gene, and it was found by, through GWAS that there was uh, association and this was replicated in a couple or in, in several other populations. Although it, this doesn't seem to be a major gene for uh, essential tremor. And then through exome sequencing there have been um, one variant that has been detected in this gene which is fused in sarcoma uh, in which uh, there is one large family uh, in which there have been found you know some uh, cases with mutations and then some stop and a stop uh, gain and two missense mutations detected in some individuals. So uh, in, in the case of um, the essential tremor, so we uh, collected several um, families from Spain in which there were several individuals affected and what we did was to uh, take some samples from some of the individuals to perform exome sequencing and after performing all that in affected and undefected individuals, what uh, it was found, it was that there were several candidate genes, uh, there were, the majority were missense mutations in five, and there was one in which there was offensive uh, deletion, uh, but in fact it was this one in which we found that there was a missense mutation which was present in this gene, which uh, when disrupted was leading to this phenotype that you see in, in the mice. So this is a, a model that was generated, uh, which was a knockout model that was generated to study um, a multiple sclerosis, because it was a gene that is involved in the myelinization of the small diameter axons in the central nervous system, and uh, this was really a very nice candidate, and then uh, the gene was explored, was analyzed for additional mutations uh, in, in cases and controls, and the majority of mutations in the cases were found in in some of the domains that are important for for this um, for this um, um, protein, and then uh, there were some functional studies that were done using transfection of uh, neuronal cells, in which there were aggregations, and on top of that. Uh, we generated also zebrafish in which uh, the gene was disrupted with some of or was uh, modified with some of the variants that were detected, missense mutations, and we saw in the in the development of the of the 
of the zebra fish that were the were path, fund, uh, path um, um, finding uh, changes that were um, quite similar to the ones that we were detecting when we knocked down uh, that gene. So this is an example of a, of, a, of a Mendelian case in which you know which is also somehow complex in which uh, you know it's, it's feasible to identify uh, variants that uh, are involved in the phenotype and you can take you know many other um, of those cases in which you have several individuals and perform the same type of studies. The other example is uh, related to intellectual disability and I think that on Monday you had also several uh, examples of that in which uh, you know, there have been many studies uh, showing that exome sequencing is really very successful uh, in the identification of genes responsible for uh, mental retardation or intellectual disability. Uh, but uh, what it's, it's, it's happening in this disorder is that there are genetic causes that are due to chromosomal alterations and then there are single gene defects and this is very heterogeneous. There are more than 400 genes that are um, responsible for uh, intellectual disability. Uh, the majority are rare variants and some of those ones have been detected over uh, many years of uh, research using linkage, using candidate gene approaches and so on. But then there are many other cases in which the cause is likely to be polygenic or really very heterogeneous. So one uh, pilot project that we did in order to check if this was, this was done in collaboration with people of the uh, clinic hospital um, here in Barcelona in which we took uh, trios of individuals that were affected and also we took um, um, seed pairs uh, in which there, was, there were um, several individuals affected uh, of the phenotype we exclude chromosomal abnormalities, we exclude the fragile X syndrome, which is the most common cause of uh, hereditary, um, hereditary um, uh, mental retardation, and then we perform exon sequencing, and through um, all that, so we identify you know, a large number of variants in every case, and then the pipeline of analysis is to um, focus on the and non-synonymous and some of those ones and rare variants after uh, doing you know the, the, the characterization and exclusion through the different databases and so on and then uh, perform uh, an analysis uh, from the point of view if the novo mutations were detected the ones that were ex-linked and also the autosomal recessive either because they were homozygous or heterozygous in a given uh, individual. So after uh, the analysis, validation and so on, uh, so there were several candidate mutations. Uh, some were mutations that uh, were occurring de novo in 15 patients. Um, there, were de novo, there were de novo missense mutations in an in, in, in already known genes involved in intellectual disability, which is a very good proof of concept that things are really working well. There were cases in which there was a deletion that was identified uh, which in theory should have been excluded through cytogenetic analysis but it was not the case so we identified this one and then there were new genes with de novo variants that were potential uh, de novo intellectual disability genes. Some were uh, segregating in an X-linked uh, fashion. So uh, just to show you some of the, of the, then you have to go through different pathway analysis and so on. And one of the genes that we detected is this THOC2 gene, which is a member of the Tho complex that uh, binds to the splice uh, messenger RNAs to facilitate the export uh, of the RNA. And um, so in there was previously one case of a missense mutation that was detected in homozygosity in a case of mental retardation. So this would be our gene. So there are already some genes that are, or at least one gene of the same family, it's known to be involved in mental retardation and some other genes that are 
uh, in the pathway have also been detected in uh, or uh, that have been found to contain mutations in either syndromic forms or um, some also syndromic forms of um, mental retardation, X-linked or uh, non-X-linked. So um, the, the, the finding of additional cases of uh, mutations in this uh, TO2 uh, gene so, uh, is really supporting that this is a new member of, um, of um, a new gene causing intellectual disability. Another example is this one here, which is this is uh, uh, this would correspond to a new autosomal uh, recessive gene for intellectual disability, and this is uh, so there is one individual that is a compound heterozygous for a mutation that was uh, carried by the mother, another one that was carried by the father, and this is a protein uh, tyrosine phosphatase receptor that has an important role in neuronal development. So the fact that in this case is um, you know coincides the two missense mutations, uh, would, which are not found you know in all the different databases and so on, uh, would be um, indicative that this would be a new gene. So if we put together all the data that has been generated in this small uh, pilot project, so we achieve a diagnosis success rate of around 65%. Um, mutations in already known uh, intellectual disability genes were detected in 30% and then um, there are new intellectual disability candidates and as I mentioned this uh, TOC2 gene uh, is a novel intellectual disability gene that was detected in a couple of uh, unrelated uh, families. So uh, I think that it's, it's clear that this is a, is, a, is, a, is a very useful approach and as you saw from the presentation uh, on Monday, uh, in some centers this is being used in a kind of routine way in order to uh, identify the, the, the genes that are uh, involved in this type of phenotype. So the third example is uh, something uh, totally different. In this case is uh, type of cancer, is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This is a, is a malignancy of the B cells. It's the most frequent leukemia in adults. Um, in general, people start with this disorder at the age of 60, 60, 60 17 years. Uh, it's more common in males, and it's clinically and biologically very heterogeneous. So there are some individuals that have mutation, uh, mutations in the immunoglobulin genes, and those ones seems to have a better prognosis and others do not have mutations in those genes. And so um, the characterization of uh, the, the, you know, the whole set of mutations that are responsible for the phenotype is important, but what is also important is to identify what is uh, leading to these individuals to develop uh, CLL. You know? So the, the goals in the consortium of the chronic lymphocytic leukemia has been to characterize or to have a catalog of all the different genomic alterations that are involved in the, in the susceptibility but also in the development of, uh, of this type of cancer and here uh, the work has been a coordination of on one hand whole genome sequencing in more than 150 cases, whole exome sequencing, RNA sequencing and also a small RNA sequencing. So the combination, and also there have been some epigenetic, so methylation analysis that has been performed. Through all these studies, especially using the somatic, uh, I mean the, the, the leukemic, leukemic cells, there are mutations in more than 100 genes that are involved in, uh, as drivers to develop the phenotype of uh, CLL, and this are some of the genes that are commonly mutated in, 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 the, in, the in the leukemia cells that are recurrently mutated, some of them with frequencies that could go to uh, up to 10% in some of, 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 of the cases and depending on the studies and the, and the subset of the, of the phenotype. But as I mentioned, uh, although now I would say that we have a very good catalog of all the different uh, mutations, somatic mutations that are responsible for CLL, we are also interested in what is really behind the development of CLL, what is leading to the susceptibility, or what is, um, is, is, what is at the very beginning of all that. So 
it has been shown through several uh, genetic analyses that CLL has a strong familial component so that there is a, an eightfold risk of developing uh, of uh, CLL in individuals that are relative of a uh, person with CLL and it's not only for CLL but it's also for other cancer types. Uh, there have been linkage studies in families that have multiple affected individuals detecting several loci but again none of the genes uh, identified by linkage were uh, have been identified so far and there have been GWAS, uh, same thing as what I, I showed before, uh, with uh, more than 25 loci that um, in theory they confer a higher risk to develop uh, CLL. But none of the genes detected by GWAS have been detected. So uh, what it has come out from these studies is that likely as a, as a susceptibility to develop CLL there are many low risk variants that predispose to the phenotype. Uh, likely a given individual will need to get several of these low risk variants in order to get uh, the final uh, higher risk than an average person in the population to, to explain that. And as it happens for other complex disorders, the experience with GWAS, which has been the target of common variants analysis in this type of phenotype, has been to at the end identified only 10% of the, of the genetic susceptibility or the familial risk to CLL. So here, because we are not only analyzing the somatic, the tumor samples, we also have the normal samples from the individual. So we separated the, lymph the B cells from the, from the granulocytes. So we should be able to explore which variants those individuals carry with respect to a control population that do not have this phenotype and then um, we could see you know how the different variants may be converging um, in either genes or in pathways to explain uh, what is behind the phenotype. Likely behind the phenotype it's not only the genetic variants of the individuals but also several external factors and this, those external factors have been claimed to be uh, viruses toxic agents and other factors. So at the end, the final susceptibility will be a consequence of all that. So in this sense, what we are doing uh, is, well, characterize all the different variants that are present in the germline of the, or in the non-cancer cells of the individuals, perform several filtering, um, evaluate for enrichment of variants in specific genes or in specific pathways, and then to test those ones. And what we have seen after this uh, rare uh, variant association analysis, in this case was using the exome uh, data set because we have a larger number of samples that have been analyzed, but also now we have you know, the whole genome of about 150 indi 50 individuals. Uh, we have seen that there are genes that are involved in cell cycle and in signal transduction. Some of those genes uh, are commonly mutated in other phenotypes with mutations that are highly penetrant but here what we are seeing is that we have mutations that in general are not disrupt disruptive mutations they are uh, missense mutations that have likely a low penetrance and that when they combine in a given individual several mutations in different genes uh, it may give you know some sort of uh, specific phenotype of higher proliferation or uh, a response that may be abnormal upon some uh, external factors that are leading to, to, to that. So now because, so this has been exome sequencing but now we have data for over 2500 uh, cancer genomes of different, more than 20 different cancer types uh, with clinical data, environmental data, and so on. And there is this project that is called the pan-cancer analysis uh, of whole genomes, uh, in which uh, the aim of this international uh, consortium is to put together all the data that has been generated at the level of whole genome sequencing for these 20 tumor cancer types, and to evaluate everything using the same pipelines of alignment to the human genome, to the reference genome, and then 
uh, calls for nucleotide changes, um, uh, indels, copy number variants, other types of structural variants, and so on, trans um, transposition, transposon mobilization, and, and, and so on. So the idea is that this is going to be really a very big um, analysis. Uh, we are about one third in, 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 the, in the process of the, the, the analysis of the, da the data is mainly a bioinformatics exercise and this involves more than 400 individuals in different laboratories and everything is done in a few centers where there is done the computing, uh, part is done at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center but also there is some that is done in, 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 in Seoul uh, and then in the US and in the UK as well and, and, and also in, uh, in, in, different, in, in Canada and in different places in the, in the US. So this will be a very good exercise because it's 2,500 uh, genomes, but as you can imagine now there are many other projects going on uh, in which we are dealing not with not only with those 2,500, but there will be thousands. You know, in the UK uh, there is a project to sequence complete sequence 100,000 individuals and similar studies are going on in several other places. However, I can tell you that this is, is complex and, and even uh, bringing together the best people in bioinformatics, this is a very, a very big uh, endeavor. So uh, here uh, we are interested in the germline again and so the idea will be to define the landscape of germline mutations across different cancer types so that we should be able to identify uh, risk to develop cancer and also uh, we are interested in uh, how uh, the crosstalk between germline and somatic changes that are occurring in the genome and, and, and we think that we have a very good, a very good um, a very good basis to, 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 to answer important uh, biological questions and to establish very good links between um, the variants of the genome and expression because in many cases there is expression data um, in addition to also environmental information. So I think that we are now moving in a situation in which we should be able to merge genomics information with uh, electronic uh, clinical data uh, so that in the future we, we will be able to answer many questions about many disorders for which we still have uh, very few clues about you know, what is really behind, what is causing uh, stroke, uh, what, are the, 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 what is the clinical outcome, uh, about the response to treatment and, 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 many, and many other aspects. And I think that this is going to happen in the next years as we are able to integrate uh, data. Uh, however, uh, as also you can imagine from the data that has been generated for complex disorders of uh, using GWAS, uh, those disorders are really very heterogeneous and uh, there are several investigators that are claiming that the only way to really understand the genetics and the biology and genomics of those disorders is by deconstructing the disease because in fact we are not dealing with one disease, we are dealing with many different disorders. It's, this is obvious in the case of cancer where we have you know, cancers of different types, but even you know, for a given cancer type, you see that you know, there are many changes and many genetic alterations. But arthritis, arthrosis, um, autoimmune disorders, cardiovascular disorders, and so on, uh, we should anticipate that they are really very heterogeneous and then that we can deconstruct the disease by performing first whole genome sequencing, transcriptome sequencing, and then we may be able to reconstruct the phenotype and then we will get compendium of genes and pathways that may provide you know, uh, a better explanation about the susceptibility to disease and also the differences uh, regarding the different phenotypes so that we will reconstruct the biology and the pathology of those disorders by uh, and dissecting this information. Uh, it is quite likely that many of these different phenotypes are the result, the result of uh, tens or hundreds of genes, so we are seeing that it's likely the case of disorders like autism, like um, 
schizophrenia and some others and that there are thousands of variants. The variants will have not always the same uh, you know, weight and the same uh, degree of uh, severity. And, so, uh, and also that in some cases uh, the, there is pleiotropy. So it could be that you know, there are variants that are responsible or that are leading to different phenotypes. And we have seen that this is the case with structural variants when you have you know, a structural variant that is responsible for autism and the same structural variant is responsible for schizophrenia and the same structural variant is responsible for uh, intellectual disability. And what it makes the difference between one and another phenotype is that those structural variants, they do not come along. They come with uh, other uh, changes in the genome, with other um, environmental factors, and uh, that is at the end a combination that is, 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 is then uh, leading to, to the phenotype. So we have uh, bad guys and we have good guys uh, that, um, that we have to see you know, how they combine. The other thing that is, I think that it's important to, 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 to think about is that uh, we are moving into a situation in which we are going to sequence the genome of a given individual many times along uh, he or, or her life. And, um, and this could happen you know, in the parents before uh, pregnancy because the parents will be making a plan about having you know, children and so on. Uh, and then there is the screening of the embryo or the fetus or the newborn to make sure that uh, we diagnose very early the, 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 the mutation or we may even you know, interrupt you know, a pregnancy because uh, there is something that we know that is wrong. Uh, and then later on uh, we want to prevent at different time points of the life of the individual um, a given disorder or because there is an infection or because there is inflammation or there is cancer and later on in the life of the individual uh, because there are different other um, aspects that we want to interrogate. So we can have the genome of a given individual analyzed or, or, or sequenced but we may be asking questions uh, over and over in a sequential way as you know the questions or, or the problems or the, the, the problems are really uh, appearing and also there is at the end so at the end of the life so there is autopsy and then you characterize you know what it was uh, wrong in the in the given phenotype so one of the projects that we are uh, now uh, promoting is this uh, project uh, that is happening in the Deschamps Women's Health uh, Hospital uh, where there are more than 50,000 women that they go every year in a medical checkup and so that means that we have clinical data that is sequentially being collected and evaluated and analyzed and so that we can perform um, a genome analysis uh, at different time points and so that the idea would be to be able to integrate and incorporate the genomic uh, information to the clinical um, health of or the, to the health of, of, of patients and also there are many pregnancies and also there is one program that has been initiated uh, which is on carrier screening because there are many donors of gametes uh, that uh, until now they were being tested only for a few genes and now they can be tested for many other genes at the same time. So uh, in the future, it, one can think that uh, we will be monitoring pregnancy, uh, not at the level only of echography and all these things, but also at the level of sensors that may be present, you know, uh, in, the, in, in, in the mother's uh, womb, and then we can evaluate at the distance if there are some uh, metabolites, uh, microRNAs, a small, uh, RNA changes that may indicate that there is something that may be wrong. But well, coming to what is real now is that we can uh, set up a specific panels. Uh, of course, we can do the exome, we can do you know whole genome and so on, but we can have specific panels that could test for all the metabolic disorders that may be affecting a given child, and then you could capture either by um, uh, 
capturing in liquid or you could perform or analyze some specific amplicons and then you perform next generation sequencing and what you have here is a panel of about uh, over um, 100 genes that are related to different amino acidopathies, organic acidurias and oxidation disorders and some of and many more of the genes that are being tested in the neonatal screening that is being performed after the birth of a given child. It's important that if we identify some of these uh, mut mutations in those genes, uh, that may lead to important uh, changes in the diet and in prevention and in, 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 in therapeutic actions. Uh, one panel that we develop and that it's, uh, it has been very, very useful is that in the case of cystic fibrosis, uh, in some communities there are just maybe 50 genes, that are 50 mutations that are responsible for the phenotype, but there are populations in which uh, um, that are very heterogeneous, that there are more than 200, 300 mutations that could be present in the individual. And then to test for all these 300 mutations, it's expensive, and also you have even some individuals in which you do not have the mutation because this has not been detected in the past. So, uh, so you could have a panel that could ex scan not only the coding regions but also the non-coding regions of CFTR and what you have here uh, are um, the detection of uh, duplicon, du duplications, in this case in the promoter region of CFTR um, and then here um, deletions in several parts of the gene and this is a very complex uh, deletion and inversion that was also detected in a given individual that was uh, totally unknown you know the molecular basis before and this is something that you detect in a single test that evaluate you know all this this is this uh, deletion in which there was deletion of this part deletion of this other part and this other region was uh, inverted so in fact what it happened is that there was an inversion and then deletion of two fragments of the gene so that was the the, the final uh, structural uh, change of the individual so this could be detected in a panel or it could be detected using whole genome sequencing but if you have to do whole genome sequencing for the whole genome uh, rather than doing the whole genome or the analysis of that so it's much better to do that and this can be done you know very quickly in a matter of a few days uh, even some variants that are indels. Indels are the most difficult uh, types of uh, genetic alterations uh, that uh, are quite difficult to characterize and in the case of CFTR uh, in, in intron uh, 9 there is one of such uh, structures which is a, is a dinucleotide repeat and, and a poly T uh, repeat that um, varies in the individuals between 9 and 13 TGs and between 3 and 9 Ts and depending on the length or, and the combination of these poly Ts and poly TGs you will have alternative splicing of exon 10 and if you have, if this exon is being spliced out you have no function and this is the major mutation that is responsible for azoospermia in, uh, in individuals in the, in, the, in the general population. So many cases of uh, males that go to fertility clinics that are being tested for CFTR, they have this mutation in combination with another mutation. But through next generation sequencing, if you use very well the algorithms, you are able to define very well the, 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 the length of the TG and the length of the poly T and then perform a proper diagnosis uh, using this type of approach. And we have <coughs> applied different types of panels to different disorders. This is polycystic in a disease, uh, type 1 and type 2, in which there are several genes and there are many different point mutations responsible and also deletions and so on. And so, um, and then we, because we had a very good characterization of the different mutations so we were able to in a blind uh, way analysis to characterize uh, using next generation sequencing uh, the mutations in the gene also detecting some deletions in PKD1 or in PKD2 as you can see uh, here. So and then you can set up you know more complex panels and this is a panel that has been set up in collaboration with Q Genomics 
and, and also with the Sheus Hospital, in which there are 215 genes that are involved in cancer susceptibility. So this is what we know today, so this is the state of the art of what is known about uh, cancer susceptibility or the heritability to cancer. And you have all the typical genes, BRCA1, BRCA2, all the genes that are involved in, in colon cancer and so on, the, the um, neurofibromatosis type 1 and, and many others, but those are the, uh, the, the ones that I'm highlighting here are the ones that are responsible for breast cancer um, heritability. And you could scan in a single uh, analysis using uh, next gen 500 or uh, HiSec and so on not only those genes, but also you can put, you know, this panel contains also all the SNPs that are, have been detected in GWAS studies um, of different cancer types. So this is something that, you know, now uh, can be done and there are in many laboratories uh, hundreds of uh, panels that have been developed and then you could uh, modify your pipelines of analysis to, to characterize and, 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 and to, to perform the, the study that you want. But one of the areas in which we have been also uh, applying, and I will show you an example of what we have been doing, is for carrier screening in reproduction. Uh, so pre-implantation diagnosis is being done now these days also through next generation sequencing or, or specific targeted resequencing for, um, for point mutations, but also uh, pre-implantation screening uh, for an this can be done by a race GH or by uh, next generation sequencing uh, using uh, different types of, of approaches. But for carrier screening, uh, this is an area that it's, it's important at different levels because either you're planning a pregnancy and then you want to um, know about if you are carrying or not mutations in a given gene and this may include the donation of gametes so there are many women that are being tested because they donate donate oocytes and of course if you are uh, if it's a woman that is receiving receiving the oocytes of from someone that is a donor you want to make sure that she is not carrying uh, you know, a point mutation that may be damaging for, for, for the children and in most of the cases they do not know that. Uh, in other cases because there is a family history of uh, genetic disorders or because there is risk, because the, there are ethnic or geographic reasons, some regions where there is a high prevalence of a given phenotype or because there is a lot of consanguinity in a given, in a given region like in the Middle East or in, in some parts of uh, the Mediterranean and then just because the parents are interested and they want to uh, know about the, the risk of passing a given, a given uh, gene with mutations. So, uh, so un until now, most of the studies that are being done uh, involve the analysis of an for, um, for prenatal diagnosis and so on, but if we put together most of the Mendelian disorders for which we could be performing a test, is about one in 100 children that are being born with a genetic disease that can be detected. And uh, most of the Mendelian disorders, although most of them are rare, uh, together as a group they are really common and uh, we can do you know, uh, better in this sense. So if we now wanted to characterize uh, in a given couple all the recessive disorders, so our target of what it's known, it's more than 4,000, and this is increasing, maybe now 5,000 and so on, uh, that, are, that have, are involved in autosomal recessive inheritance. Um, most of them have a low penetrance. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, there is the issue of the ethnicity and the geographical areas and so on. Uh, the importance of consanguinity, because in many cases there are uh, issues of consanguinity that can be detected. And then uh, the ideal situation would be to use a panel that detects the most prevalent disorders and especially the ones that will, be, uh, will have major consequences from the point of view of the phenotype. So you don't want to test for things that will be developing later on in life uh, if, because, well, in the future there may be a treatment and also uh, they may not be affecting the individual. So the target in this type of carrier screening is on one hand autosomal recessive disorders and on the other hand X chromosome linked disorders that can be detected for which you know the mother uh, may be a carrier but it's not she is not clinically affected and we 
have now the possibility to identify uh, those, those ones. And we want to test not for, you know, color blindness or some other uh, phenotypes that are not really relevant from the health point of view, but for severe disorders that may have potential consequences uh, for, for the child. So as I mentioned, uh, we have several options. Of course, we can do the whole genome, but, uh, but we are not interested in all the information of the genome, and it's still expensive, difficult to analyze, and we need to just extract uh, the, what we are interested in. So we could do the exome as uh, what it was uh, uh, being presented uh, last, uh, you know, the other day. So that's one possibility. Uh, but most of the information, it's difficult to interpret and we will be discarding most of it. Uh, and we can target just the genes that are known to cause disease uh, and or the genes that will, but we will not be interested in Alzheimer's um, and some other phenotypes or Parkinson's disease and so on because we, I think that this is not the target of, you know, or the purpose of what we are doing. So we want, we will be sc scanning for the genes that will cause, you know, a serious disorder, uh, especially during childhood. So in this sense, there was this test that was developed in which it contains, you know, selected diseases that are prevalent because the geographic area, uh, most of the disorders that are being detected in, metabolo in metabolic disorders that are detected in neonatal screening, and also several mutations that are um, specific of uh, genetic disorders that are, that are severe. So in total, there are 71 genes for which there is a complete uh, characterization and then some other 130 genes in which there are exons that are the, mo the ones that contain most of the mutations and in total there are more than 200 uh, disorders being detected and that involves more than 3,000 pathogenic mutations. So this was the version 1, version 2 that now it's under development uh, will have a different, a different setup, but I'm, I'm showing you know the results of uh, over 500 um, uh, cases that have been tested, in which uh, mutations have been detected in over 40% of the individuals that are carrying at least one recessive uh, disorder. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned, 56% there were no carriers of the serious or the severe disorders or the mutations that will lead to uh, a serious disorder and then about 30% were carrying one mutation and then individuals about 10% two, two mutations and then and, and so on even some individuals that were carrying you know four or five uh, different mutations. Uh, so the carrier frequencies that were detected through this uh, screening uh, were quite similar to the, what it has been reported in the literature. As you can see, uh, figures uh, do not vary much, uh, but of course as the number of uh, cases uh, are, being, are increasing, so uh, this will probably will get a much better picture of the real carrier frequencies for, for those disorders. So uh, one of the important issues is how we translate this information to the patients. Uh, it's clear that everyone, we are carrying mutations in many different genes. Uh, in this case, we are not exploring the whole genome. We are exploring you know, uh, a set of genes and it's expected that about uh, 40 or 50 percent of the individuals will be carrying one uh, mutations, mutation that will be serious in the to, for the individual. And then, um, well, but we need to explain that, you know, that everyone is carrying uh, mutations and that uh, then that, you know, the conversions or, or, or the coincidence of uh, mutations in a couple, it's not going to be, it's not going to be perfect, but, uh, or it's not going to, uh, to match, but we, we, we want to make sure that they will not be, uh, we will not uh, have couples that will carry the mutation in the same in the same gene. So uh, here what is important is all the genetic counseling, the visit to provide genetic information to the couple, it's important the uh, informed consent for the mutation carriers, 
uh, to obtain DNA or, or uh, from blood and or saliva, and then um, the bioinformatic analysis that is being done in reference laboratories and genomics with a very good bioinformatic uh, characterization, and then there is genetic counseling once we have the results and the report is being delivered so that the information is being trans translated and that and that you know all this uh, is being explained uh, really uh, properly. So uh, I would say that these are, uh, this is an example of you know, uh, some of the applications, but as I mentioned, for many of the complex disorders, we are now have fantastic tools of next generation sequencing, exon, whole genome, RNA. RNA has not been used much for, uh, you know, from the diagnostics point of view, but my guess is that this is going to increase uh, very rapidly as we, um, especially as we are getting better and better tools for, for the analysis, but for the majority of human disease, uh, we are now uh, going in this situation of a, a genome-centric approach in which we will be first characterizing the genome, uh, characterizing the genes that are responsible for the different uh, phenotypes. In some cases there will be a gene responsible for several phenotypes, in other cases there will be many genes that will lead to uh, a given phenotype. And then if we are able to, at the same time, to mm, dissect the environmental component, uh, of uh, gene modifiers, disruptors, and so on, so we will get a really uh, very good understanding of what's really behind the biology of the different uh, diseases, but it's clear that we are now moving in a sort of personal omics for health and disease manage management, and that uh, along the life of a given individual, we will not only have you know, our genome totally characterized, but we will have you know, uh, the transcriptome at different type points, we will have the metabolome being characterized and so on, and so that this will lead to a um, sort of personalized diagnosis and treatment of uh, the different uh, disorders and, and phenotypes. And there are already several good examples on how you can identify uh, for a given individual the appearance of uh, di type 2 diabetes as a result of you know, an infection that likely happened, so there was a viral infection, and then uh, because uh, the individual was tested at different time points uh, uh, from the transcriptomics, metabolomics, and, and point of view, uh, this was could be linked with the genomic information, and in fact, the individual was carrying several uh, variants that were um, responsible for susceptibility to uh, type 2 di diabetes. And there will be many other cases, and I would say that the case of cancer is perhaps the one that is going to to be uh, more important in the in the in the next in the next years because we are very close to uh, have a very comprehensive uh, characterization of uh, cancer uh, the, the driver mutations in given in a given cancer but also of the uh, variants that are responsible for cancer susceptibility and this is it thank you very much so I'm very happy to take questions. No, not necessarily. Uh, so it, it is unknown. So it's, it could be that there are some hormonal factors that are behind. Um, it is unknown. So it's, I mean, yeah. But this happens to several disorders uh, that are more common in one gender than, in al than another. And, and, and this is, is, is it's just there, it's epidemiological information that, that is there, but I don't think that it will have to do with uh, mutations in the X chromosome, but with some other factors, maybe, yeah. Maybe how, you know, people are coping with, you know, some infectious factors or some environmental, or maybe the, the hormone response uh, may have an important role. For yeah. detection yeah. of the structural variants, would you recommend DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing? Uh, I think that 
DNA sequencing would be the way to go, uh, but it would be at the level of whole genome sequencing, mm. uh, because that's the way to characterize better the structural variants, because you will be detecting inversions, duplications, transpositions of genetic material and so on. Uh, I think that now we are getting very good pipelines that allow to perform a very good characterization of structural variants. Exome sequencing is also able to identify copy number variants, so gains and losses of genetic material, uh, although mm, they're not very robust in general. And, uh, and then, uh, well, array CGH or, or SNP genotyping is another way to characterize uh, those ones. The RNA SEC is good in the sense that you could identify some potential um, um, you know, um, split reads, so chimeric genes in case you know, that the structural variant is leading to some, uh, but this, yes, fusion genes and so on. So that could, could, could be there. So I think that is a combination of what, but I would say structural, I mean, whole genome sequencing, I think that is the way to go. Although it's true that there are some uh, regions that are very complex because uh, when you have many seg or segmental duplications that are really very large, it is difficult to have a very good alignment and an assembly of those of those regions. And in this sense, uh, um, if you could perform uh, sequencing using PAC Bio, which is you know this. Uh, Yes, they have long reads and so on. Or you could perform um, Illumina sequencing using reads that are about 20 kbs, so that they have you know mate pairs that are 20 kbs apart, and this is able to jump uh, through um, structural variants or, or segmental duplications that are that are complex. Yeah.